Hello, I'm Tim Holy, and welcome to the fourth session of Advanced Scientific Computing, Producing Better Code. Uh, today's session is going to be on continuous integration, documentation, package versioning, and releases. Being at this fourth session, it's probably just worth reviewing where we've been and where we're going. Uh, our first lecture introduced the Julia programming language. We've then had, this is now the third of three sort of process oriented lectures that sort of introduce open source and how to participate in it through Git and, and uh, providers like GitHub, principles of automated testing. And then today we'll be wrapping that up by talking about continuous integration and the sort of versioning and release process. Then the final two lectures of the course are going to focus on uh, sort of a deeper dive into Julia and its performance model and generally obtaining high performance in computing. Um, and so that it'll be a relatively dramatic shift after this session. Okay, so today again is really focused on process and I wanna begin by just um, have you imagine that you're actually in a software company. Um, uh, you know, much of this is directed to individuals and we'll get to that in a minute, but a lot of the new processes I think have originated in a larger setting and then trickled down to smaller developers, individual developers. And so um, the corporate sort of process very, uh, you know, sort of early on um, was that development occurred by breakage and relatively rare releases. So you might imagine you get your team together and you hammer out a, 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 the, the first working version of your software and release it as 1.0. And then from that point forward, there's a bit of a split. One team, sometimes called operations, fixes bugs and they release, you know, 1.1 and, and so on. Meanwhile, a second team, your developer team, they sort of figure out the lessons learned from creating 1.0, and then they decide what needs to be changed and improved for version two, and they start it. In some cases, this might, you know, really in the old days have even been essentially a complete, you know, rewrite of certain at least core components. And often these core decisions really sort of determine the structure of a project. And so these could have sometimes been extremely disruptive changes. Um, you know, and these two teams are doing these sort of very two separate kinds of activities. And then eventually they would go on to try and, you know, sort of get back together again, release version 2.0. At that point, that becomes the version that operation supports, and then they go on. Now, this model had a number of weaknesses, and probably the biggest one of them is that they, you know, you might have a multi year gap between releases. And the problem with this model is that the, the, the in development version of, of the software might really essentially be broken for a lot of that time. And that introduces a lot of problems. So one of them is, is, that, is that because of the long gap, um, back when you go back to trying to you know, make sure that you can do all the things you needed to do that were good about version one, any divergences that have arisen in the meantime can be very hard to reconcile. Um, if version two is, is not runnable over long periods of time, you may discover serious design flaws very late in the process, and that gets extremely expensive. Um, and there's even just, I think, a large cost to, your, to, the, um, you know, to the people who are involved in the project. You, you don't get feedback rapidly about the uh, outcomes of the choices you've made. There are silos between people who work on different things. And you know, just it's it's nice to see your software out there and being used. And when your releases are that rare, those rewards come very rarely. Um, and so, you know, this this model had a lot of costs, and and those became worse as software has you know gotten more and more complicated. Um, you know, that can that can both jeopardize the corporate model, but also the satisfaction of people producing this code. And so in modern times, this is, you know, things are done, you know, both you might say the same and differently, mostly, you know, uh, differently, although there are commonalities. The, the big sort of one of the biggest changes is that at least internally, this whole process has been um, sort of changed in, in how it's nested instead of giant changes that and making one trip through this sort of cycle of spin something off and then get it out there over time scales of years this is done hundreds thousands hundreds of thousands of times between each official release 
um, uh, on, a, on a far smaller, more rapid time scale. So at least internally, you might make small frequent releases and you try to keep things working at all times and features get developed in their own branches and then released to whoever are, are your intended targets whenever you know, they are ready. Right? And this might be, again, your, your, your users might see infrequent rare releases, but internally you see continuous change and, and development and updates to a working collection of code, basically. Um, and one of the other things that's much more common with the modern way of developing software is that an individual uh, you know, developer programmer might interact with all stages of the pipeline. So meaning you might both support bugs in the previous version if it's an area of the software that you know well, and also be working on developing the, the latest release. And so this, this change in process is sometimes called DevOps for that reason. It, it sort of combines the tasks of developers and the operations staff. Um, and, and, you know, it has certainly has become, you know, sort of a dominant paradigm in the production of large scale software. Um, this seems like it has a lot of demands. You need to have very good, trustworthy, and automated tests that you can use to ensure your quality. You need to have mechanisms for, for status updates and, and communication among uh, contributors. And there have to be very easy mechanisms for making new releases, both perhaps those smaller internal releases, but then also you know, when you package it up and, and send it out into the larger world. And all this seems like a lot of infrastructure, but I think from a standpoint of an individual developer, like the sort of overall target of, 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 of this course, the good news is that essentially all of those tools have emerged uh, out into openly, freely accessible packages and, and platforms that allow you to adopt this sort of style in your own uh, development practice. And so I want to show you how this works, first of all, to just sort of show you what this whole cycle looks like, the sort of needing to make easily accessible to developers the results of automated testing, the, the, the ability to communicate among, among developers, and easy mechanisms for making release. I'm going to show you an example of this on a real-world Julia package um, uh, using GitHub platform um, uh, you know, uh, processes for testing that run on GitHub um, and uh, the mechanisms that the Julia community has established for supporting all this and making good releases. So let me first start with an individual pull request. We've gone over those in previous sessions now. And so this is a pull request to a package that I know well. It's called Julia Interpreter. It's an important package because it underlies both Julia's uh, uh, main debugger um, as well as uh, a, a package I've been involved in called Revise. Um, and so this is a pull request by an individual contributor, um, very talented one, um, and uh, has has done great things, uh, um, gotten a couple of emojis indicating the fact that we thought this was an impressive contribution. And what um, the, 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 the automated pipeline here might not immediately attract your attention, but I want to draw your attention to this little red X here. And if you click on this, what you can see is that this opens up a little window. And what this indicates is this indicates jobs running on different kinds of computers on different versions of Julia that run the automated test suite. Now, in our last session, we talked about testing and the importance of developing a large automated test suite. And so this shows the consequences of running that test suite on all these different platforms. So we're testing Linux, Macs, and Windows machines. We're testing the original stable release of Julia, Julia 1.0, plus the current stable release, which, which at the time of this pull request and, and, and still is, is 1.6. Um, and you can even see that this is tested on the in-development version of Julia. So every night, the, 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 the not yet released version of Julia gets built. It's publicly accessible. You can download it and run everything you want yourself. We've got this set up so that anytime a pull request comes in, it also runs it on nightly. And that's partly because this package is, is somewhat unusual in diving deep into Julia's internals. And it, it, even though the Julia as a sort of external language um, is stable, the internals often change as we improve the implementation of how things work, how the compiler works, et cetera. 
And so it's very important for a package like this to test itself against the nightly uh, you know, release of Julius so that we know when something has broken it, right? Um, and so all these green check marks mean that all the tests pass on all of these platforms. So that's fantastic. Um, and um, you can even see that the ability to build and deploy, so building and deploying the documentation work too. So this package has documentation attached to it. The only part of this pull request that failed is actually this code cov part. And we talked a little bit about that. Remember that's a service that analyzes the percentage of lines that are ex exercised by the tests. Um, and this is the only part, that, uh, part of it that failed. You can see a report that's right here. Often what's even more useful is if you click on the files changed and you scroll through, you can see, for instance, reports on individual lines that show a particular line that was, that was not tested. That was true even in the final merge version of this. And so you can, you can see that this, you know, that this pull request did great overall and that its only flaw is that it wasn't really all that thoroughly tested in its initial submission. Right, and so here you can see that the this this is sort of a measure of of what the overall project testing would become if this were merged. This is a, a measure of how much of the changes in this particular commit or this particular pull request are tested. And you can see it initially it started out much lower than the sort of standard that had been set in the rest of the project, and that's you know so when it's only a tiny tiny difference, you might say that's Good enough, right? I'm not going to worry about a 0.1% change in my coverage, right? This is an awesome feature. Let's merge it. Um, but you know, this is a pretty substantial decrease, right? And so, you know, there was a little bit of detailed discussion on the on the on the um, implementation that was here, and that was that was great. Um, and then, you know, I remarked that. Uh, you know, one of the main things that was left after the um, after the uh, earlier discussion was it just simply needed more tests, and that's a sign that that's really the bottleneck to merging this. Um, and so the author of this uh, pull request added some tests, um, and then we got this thing merged. And so and then, so you can see in the final version of the pull request, there's a green check indicating at all stages of the uh, of the automated testing. You can see now these changes are, are even raising the bar on our on our testing in this in this in this repository. And so all is good. Let's get this thing merged uh, and 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 out there and available. Okay, so. The things that this illustrates for you is that none of the others who participated in this conversation had to go about downloading the software onto their own machines, testing it, worrying that what if it breaks on a Mac and I don't have a Mac or something like that. All of these tests are run automatically for you. It's visible as soon as you open up this web page and you look at the at the status of the pull request and you can learn whether it's really you know looking solid and ready for a serious discussion or whether this might be an in progress uh, you know sort of contribution that that the author still has work to do before getting it up to snuff. So that um, is is a demonstration of what's called this continuous integration process and the and and the ability to run your automated test suite on many different uh, platforms and versions of Julia uh, to test it. Okay, so that's a very oh the other thing I did want to show you is if something does go wrong and it didn't in this in the in this example so maybe this isn't the best example of that but if you if one of them these were to fail for example. You might click on this, and what you can see here is a log that if you dive in, um, you can see this is the this is something that runs your test suite. And if you click on it and open it, you can see a full log of the entire run. At this point, maybe you're you're familiar with these outputs from Julia's test standard library, and you can see the consequences here. Were there to be a failure, then the, then in this section of this log file, you would you would see the details of this failure. Okay. So that's an extremely powerful asset to have at your disposal if you're reviewing a pull request, if this is your repository and you're, see, you're seeing a contribution made by an outside contributor, um, it, it can greatly speed your process of understanding what the status of this change will be. The other key component of of uh, being able to efficiently release code is to actually be able to make a release. And so let me now show you the home page of this very same repository. And I'm going to call your attention over here on the right hand side to this releases section of the home page. You can see the latest one here, GitHub 
updates them by date, not by version number. So occasionally this is a little bit misleading. There could be a more a, a newer version of the software available, but it was but a, a an update to an older version was released more recently. So it, sometimes it's worth just clicking on this more complete releases tab. And here you can see it really some, some nice summary of what went into this release, right? You can click on this link and you can actually see the line by line differences between uh, the previous release and this one. You can you know, uh, see which pull requests were merged and, and their authors. Were there closed issues? There, there were not in this one. The, this could have been an issue, but the author just submitted a fix for it at the same time as reporting the issue. Um, you would, you'd see that too. And so you might imagine, oh, wow, that's nice, but man, that's a lot of work to put that together. And the answer is it's not, right? So when we made the last release, what you can see here is this, you know, sort of bump version pull request. And if we click on this on this commit, you can see that all it did was increase the last digit here. We'll talk about what these version numbers mean today. And then the person making the release simply posted a comment on this issue um, to register this version of the release. This audit, this bot, the Julia Registrator bot, picked it up. It submitted a pull request to the so-called general registry. And let's go follow that and see what that looks like. And so you can see that this is a small change here. It doesn't, all it does is update which version is the current one. In some other cases, it might update the compatibility or which packages or dependencies or other things like that. So it's not always this simple of a change. And then this process ran on the registries tests. It checked for things like, are you making changes to the minimum Julia version supported? If so, that needs a, a spe special handling. Um, have you changed the license so that it's not a free license anymore? That would cause, this would prevent this from being merged and therefore it wouldn't really become a release yet. But the automated tests ran and this pull request, this update met all of the guidelines that the Julia community has established. It got merged and within 15 minutes basically out, out into the wild so that everybody can, uh, uh, has it available. So the key things that I think are worth emphasizing here are that, um, uh, let's see here, sorry, somehow I closed my, uh, the correct window. I apologize. Okay, so we saw how easy it was then to make a release, um, have it create a very nice summary of the changes automatically for us and get those out into the outside world. So these are the essential requirements that make it easy to have a collaborative open development process that adds features with confidence and gets those out on a regular basis to the users. Okay, so this whole process is some called DevOps, and the key component of the, is this continuous integration, this ability to easily merge changes into the sort of main branch of your repository after running your automated test suite. There have been a number of scientific analyses of the consequences of projects that adopt continuous integration. I'm giving links to several of those papers here. Um, overall, these studies come to a number of fairly consistent consensuses. One of the ones that may be a little bit surprising, I think it was surprising in terms of the initial ambitions of continuous integration or CI as it's typically abbreviated, is that the study said that in practice, having CI doesn't tend to really reduce how long pull requests stay open. And that was, I think, something that, that was counter to many people's expectations. That suggests that the bottlenecks on the duration of, of pull requests staying open lie other than the, uh, you know, the, other than, uh, the factors that CI influences. However, there is a was a, is quite a strong consensus that the presence of or adoption of CI is correlated with about a threefold increase in the overall number of pull requests to projects. That's a huge, huge effect. Now, the causality of that is undetermined. None of these studies, for I think 
pretty obvious reasons are randomized controlled trials, right? We're not, nobody forced developers not to adopt CI or to adopt CI. These are retrospective studies of projects that midstream adopted it partway through. And so it might well be that having CI essentially puts out a welcome map that attracts more contributors. Uh, the other possibility is that a package is growing um, popularity and 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 growing number of contrib contributors essentially forces the the package to switch to a more automated pipeline because th there's no other good way to keep up with the with the with the flow. Whatever the reason, the 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 adoption of 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 CI is correlated with a dramatic increase in the number of pull requests. And another uh, feature that emerged from these analyses is that the is that uh, successful pull requests, one that pass their continuous integration tests, um, are typically much more successful in attracting code review by humans, right? So um, it suggests a strong tendency of developers to go check in on a pull request, look at the outcome of the CI. If it passes, now say, okay, I'm going to look at the code and start providing a serious code review. But if the pull request fails its test, you say, okay, this probably isn't yet really ready to review. I'm just going to let the let the person who's submitting this thing fix it up with a couple more commits, and then once it passes, I'll take a look. Um, I think one of the, so again, causality is very hard to determine in these kinds of studies. I think one of the clearest pieces of evidence that CI really changes the workflow is in the following analysis, trying to understand sort of the mechanism of changes in the time delay between when a pull request was submitted and when it was delivered in a release to the outside world. And what they tried to do was they, they measured that time and then they determined the explanatory power of different variables. And so maybe most easily it's worth starting here of the explanatory power of variables after adopting uh, continuous integration. And what you can see is that in that analysis, overwhelmingly, the, the most important variable is the so-called Q rank. Now I have that here on the next slide. Um, so that is simply a measure of when in the release cycle was the pull request submitted. It's normal to expect that a pull request that gets submitted right at the beginning of a release cycle is going to have, have to wait a long time before it gets in the hands of the users, right? Simply because it may be months away from a new release, you know, whether it's weeks or months, it depends on the project, but you know, you know, it may be a long time before the next release. So of course it's going to have a long delay. Um, and one conversely, one that gets submitted shortly before the closing of the merger window, you know, might have a much shorter time to get out in the hands of the, of the users. So you expect that variable to play an important role. And what this suggests is that nothing else serves as an even more important bottleneck. In contrast, in projects before they adopted continuous integration, the so-called merge workload, it's essentially the backload of unreviewed pull requests, is the dominant factor that determines how long a given pull request remains um, uh, uh, before it gets out in the hands of users, basically. And so that, that's despite the fact that you know Q rank has to be an important variable, but the merge backlog was even more important. And I think this is maybe the clearest, you know, connection to us, maybe a causal role that CI plays in changing the overall workflow, right? So, so one, this strongly suggests that what that adopting continuous integration dramatically reduces reviewer workload to make it less of a bottleneck. And this certainly agrees with my own subjective experience of, of using continuous integration on, on, on uh, essentially all the time. Um, one of the criticisms and one of the main reasons given for not adopting continuous integration is that it's a real burden. As you'll see, in principle, there's an awful lot that you have to know, a lot of different settings you have to turn on, et cetera. And so there was a relatively recent analysis of over the thousand papers published in the Journal of Open Source Software. This is one of the, this is probably the main uh, place to publish descriptions of software itself, not the, say, scientific conclusions that you draw from the software, but the actual software itself. Um, and in this analysis, it, it analyzed about a thousand papers. There are many different programming languages represented among them. Surely some of them were Julia, but many other languages as well. Probably most of them were not Julia. And what you can see is that is that um, uh, almost 80% of the 
piece of software, despite the fact that they were being written up for publication in a journal focused on open source software, were not using continuous integration as, uh, as part of their of their workflow. So that's a very suggests a very very low rate of adoption of these practices among sort of smaller scale projects, which may be driven by one or a few individuals, basically. Right. And so, you know, the, 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 the challenges of adopting this are often cited as the main reason for not doing it. But if you look at the Julia community, it's dramatically different. In a recent analysis, um, a couple of colleagues um, ran, it was found that 95% a, a of all Julia packages use some form of continuous integration. It is almost ubiquitous in the, in the Julia community to adopt this practice. Moreover, they found that 84% uh, of all packages have uh, you know, at least 20 lines of tests and, and more than half of them have more, at least 20% of their entire code base as tests. 88% have some kind of documentation. 96% have an uh, open source initiative approved license, which has now be recently become a requirement for new releases. So all of these suggest that this Julia community is really firing on all cylinders in terms of meeting using good practice in getting their code out to out to the community it's really quite amazing and so you might say okay well maybe this is just a very like large teams behind this all this kind of stuff and that is not true the median number of contributors per package was two right so most of the packages in the general registry some have attracted hundreds of developers of course but the median number is two and yet even these two one and two person efforts have adopted continuous integration or using it on a daily basis. The only way that can happen is if it's easy, right? And not only easy to get going, but it has to be rewarding to use it in practice. If it's more effort maintaining the system than you get from using it, the system will start collapsing, right? And that hasn't happened. And so I think it's, I think it's you know, clear to see that the Julia community has really figured out how to do this on an individual developer scale. And so the purpose of today's session is now simply to show you what's needed to get this going. And the answer is not very much. Um, and you know what it looks like to maintain it over the lifetime of a project. And so um, what is required to make it easy? Well, the first and maybe the most important one is to adopt you know, continuous integration from the very beginning of the project. This isn't a transition to make late in the game. Do it from the moment you create the package that that will contain your source code there are in the julia community there are good tools for setting it up initially and there are good tools for maintaining it and this takes a lot of burden off of the developers and the only thing that really needs you know that remains is to just simply train people in how you use these tools and that's the purpose of the remaining part of today and so just as a brief summary, all these are clickable links. You can get this uh, lecture off of the associated uh, uh, GitHub uh, website in my, in my GitHub account. Um, and um, uh, so the key one really is package templates, which sets up all phases of this at the moment that you create your package. Julia Actions is an organization, a GitHub organization that maintains and improves all of our continuous integration scripts. Compat Helper is a very nice tool uh, for staying up to date with the, the packages your package depends on. Um, if you're starting to rely on outdated releases, you'll get a pull request that will um, so you try and see what happens if your package still passes tests with the newer version. And if everything looks good, you can merge it. Um, there's that registrator, you saw that in action, and Tagbot together make releasing new versions and having it essentially write automated release notes for you, just a breeze and works very, very well. Key part of software adoption is documentation, and the, the amazing documenter package provides important, uh, useful tools for building documentation, hosting it online, uh, and all of that can build up on GitHub so that you don't have to push things locally. And then some things are sufficiently rare that we're, I'm not going to talk about them today, but you should know they're out there. If you maintain a large number of repositories and you dis discover that there's a rare change that you have to make across hundreds of repositories, there are ways to automate that too. So there are packages for using the so-called API of these hosting providers and directly in an automated fashion making mass updates, basically. Okay, so 
the foundation of all of this, at least as I recommend doing it, is this is this very nice package called Package Templates. And you, I have in the previous homeworks that you've done for this course, you have been using this package, and it's now time to explain what some of these options actually do. So you you load the package, and then you create a template. A template is the skeleton that will be provided to set up your package initially. You don't yet provide the name of the package. You you essentially apply uh, that as an argument to it, the template sort of as a function call um, to create the new package. But this essentially describes the structure you want that package to have. And so the, there are really sort of three plugins that you're providing here. First one is GitHub Actions. This specifies a particular continuous integration provider. There are many such options, and 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 you know I've used I've used some others in the past. I haven't certainly tried all of them. You can make a choice of which one you want, but for the purposes of this course, you know we'll be using GitHub Actions, which is the most widely used one currently, at least in the Julia community. Um, we talked in our last session about CodeCov, this site that, that, that hosts uh, data on um, your test coverage um, so that you can go and inspect how thoroughly tested your package is. This essentially causes it to push your data there and, 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 and integrate it uh, in part with, with GitHub. There's a little bit of manual configuration needed, required that also covered in the last homework. Um, and then finally, this says, yes, I also want to have standalone web browsable documentation associated with my package beyond the standard readme. And this says, please build that documentation up on GitHub Actions and, and host and deploy it up there. Okay, so that's the meaning of these three plugins here. These are the things that set up this DevOps pipeline for your package, taking all the burden off of you. And what these do is they essentially just write a series of files that turn on all the various configuration settings that you're likely to use. They can each take individual arguments if you need to customize certain aspects of these behaviors. Now, the, what the kinds of files that package templates writes for you are typically in sort of three different um, uh, sort of languages, if you will, besides Julia, right? Um, so one of them is called Markdown. We've already covered that a little bit in this course. This is what's used for Julia documentation. And, and um, uh, so a couple of links here if you're unfamiliar with Markdown. Um, uh, uh, the next one is TOML, stands for Tom's Obvious uh, or, or Minimal Language. And this is the language that both the project.toml and manifest.toml file are written in. And this is essentially what's used to, to, to manage compatibility and, and versions and things like that. And the final one is this uh, language that uh, has a recursive algorithm, YAML ain't markup language. And this is the language that GitHub um, uh, requires you to write all of those actions in. And package templates, again, creates all of these scripts for you in these various languages. So to get going, you don't really need to understand any of them, but I'm going to explain at least a few basics about them today because you do sometimes need to make tweaks to these in order to manage your project, okay? Now, these are not Julia specific, right? All three of these are widely used across the, the software ecosystem. Um, just to show you, if you haven't seen it yet, what a mark, what Markdown looks like, it, it's mimicking the sort of way that people used to indicate document structure and email prior to the development of, of other more graphical ways of displaying things. And so, you know, you can have headers and uh, emphasis and lists and, 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 you know, quoting block quotes and other things like this. And if you, you, you may actually even recognize the, a lot of these sort of this syntax has been adopted by social media platforms and things like that for marking up the text and posts that people make there too. So this may not be all that strange and unfamiliar of, of a syntax to you. It's worth, if you've not looked at it, you know, read about the, read about the syntax using the links provided um, so that you can get good at writing this format. Um, to build then your documentation from Markdown, Documenter expects a certain folder structure. So if your overall package starts, you know, looks like this, we've seen a lot about what goes on in the source folder. There's also not shown a test folder, of course, equally in, in, in some ways uh, important to the source folder. Now we're going to touch on this docs folder. And so this only gets written if you specified a document or option to package templates. You can, of course, create these yourself, but it's much easier to let Documenter do it. 
And the structure of this folder here is, is that it has its own source folder. This is not a source of Julia code generally. It's actually the source for your markdown files that describe the web pages you want Documenter to build for you. And then there's also a Julia script make, which has a number of options that you can tweak. And I, again, I encourage you to read the documentation on Joc Documenter to learn how to do this, you know, sort of in detail. The main thing I want to cover now actually is the process of writing good documentation. And this is a difficult thing to do. First, if you are the developer of your package, you are both uniquely well positioned to write the documentation and uniquely poorly positioned to write the documentation because you know a lot about the internals, right? And that's both good and bad. Um, you might, you know, so it takes some practice to learn how to write documentation in a manner that's approachable to newbies. And as is often the case, get attracting outside contributions to improve your documentation is often a, a huge windfall to a project. But nevertheless, it is a skill. It's a skill that you can practice and get better at. Um, for many years, I just sort of found my own way forward. I relatively recently came across sort of a framework for writing documentation that I like quite a lot. And the author of this framework breaks the, breaks the needs of users into sort of four quadrants along two axes. So one axis here is what task we're engaged in right now. Are we learning the, the package initially? Or are we using the package hoping to write some code, basically, right? And then the other one is, uh, you know, is it that we're really interested in the, in the practical aspects of getting going or in a deeper understanding of how the package works? And the point that this author makes is that all four forms of these documentation are essentially necessary and that it makes it easier on your readers if these don't all mix together into one big pile, but instead are clearly demarcated as clearly as you can. There are, of course, overlaps between these things and in intermediate cases, right? But as clearly as you can, try to actually separate out the documentation in the in these forms. And I should say that, you know, I've discovered this relatively recently, and so I've written relatively little documentation that adheres to this. Um, but, you know, it's certainly something that I uh, am starting to embrace, and in my sort of steps towards adopting this, I'm finding it actually to be a useful framework. So just to explain what goes on in these different sort of um, uh, sort of quadrants of the figure, and you can read more by following this link here. The function of a tutorial is really it's directed at the bare beginner of something. And, and the author gives an analogy to teaching a small child how to cook. You might have to teach them about washing their hands or knife safety or other things like that, right? Um, for a how-to guide that is is also directed to the sort of um, you know uh, uh, more the pragmatic phase of of actually getting something done, and the analogy there in cooking might be more like a recipe in a cookbook. So at that point, you can assume a certain level of understanding about the operating rules of a kitchen, right? You're not going to walk in each recipe the user through again, how to wash hands, what nice safety is, et cetera. You're going to assume all, all of that as a baseline. And what you're instead going to do is present a very efficient directed pipeline for getting a particular job done, much like you present a recipe, you know, with a, a list of ingredients and a set of steps that you should follow in order to cook a particular uh, meal, for example, right? So, and you might have many different guides that give the illustrate how you solve many different problems in a complicated package that does many different things right so you know in an image processing library you might have one guide on how you blur an image another one on how you recognize in blobs in an image or you know other things like that right so um, all of those those are are there and those are very different from the tutorials which have a newcomer getting started who needs the, needs the sort of rules of the road, basically. The next category is the reference documentation. This is the thing that you consult when, for instance, you're in the middle of writing code and you can't remember the precise arguments that you specify to a, provide to a given function or what the name of the keyword arguments are or exactly what it's returning and, 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 and you know, what it's computing, for example, right? And so that, that reference documentation is utterly essential. It's just as important as all of the others. So what we've discussed so far 
um, but, it, but it fills a very different need. And then the final category is the exp uh, explanation. This is addressed to basically, you know, your, your imagined user who finally now gets some aspect of your, of your package, but might be confused about why you made a particular design choice, right? Or, you know, how does this approach compare to something else? You know, the, the, all of these kinds of questions become natural to people who get particularly curious about your package, if they might be thinking about extending it or improving it in some fashion, they're going to need that kind of information um, because it's going to set the appropriate context uh, for them to help judge where they can make effective contributions. But it, it's not the first thing that a brand new user to your package needs in general, right? And so it should be clearly separated out into its own section. Okay, so that covers documentation. Now we're going to go to some of these other aspects of configuration, right? And again, all of these are set up for you initially by package templates. You don't usually have to mess with them instantly. You, you might have to do some, though, in the early phases of your package. So for example, if you're adding dependencies, that will the package manager will automatically update your TOML file, but you might have to make some tweaks to that. And in fact, I encourage you to do so. So it's worth knowing a little bit about these formats. So the, these, these two formats have some very important similarities. They both have sort of a key value structure mimicking a dict in Julia, right? Um, their syntax for this is different, right? So in TOML, the syntax is essentially a key equals value syntax, right? So this is, you know, this is the dictionary key and this is the value. TOML files also have sections indicated with these square, single square brackets on either side. And you can really think of these as nested dicks. So in underneath a set, one of these new headers, you'll find additional key value pairs. And these are really like a dictionary inside of a dictionary, right? Um, in um, YAML, they, they, it's also a key value structure, but the syntax here is to use a colon rather than an equal sign. And in YAML, the, the nesting is indicated by increasing the amount of indentation rather than through these sort of section headers. Okay, so indentation is meaningful in a YAML file, but, but, but not so much in a TOML file. Both of these formats also support arrays. So in TOML, you know, this always would look like a Julia array. In YAML, it has a so-called inline syntax, which might look like this. So that's quite similar, except for the equals versus colon. But YAML also supports a markdown style of making a list. And so this is actually equivalent to this um, here, right? Just with very different syntax. This is only a very superficial look at the features in these. YAML in particular is a lot more complicated um, and, and you know, occasionally you, you want that complexity, uh, hence I think the reason for choosing it, um, but, but it certainly does take a little longer to sort of wrap your head around it, basically. So just to show you what one of these files look like, this is a TOML file and this is taken from the overall TOML website. And so you can see these key value pairs and then these different sections here that essentially again indicate a nested dictionary. Um, you can see that, you know, you can store a variety of things. This is another inline dictionary uh, syntax here with those curly braces. Um, and, um, you know, there's sort of essentially a series of a few data types that it supports, including interestingly dates and times, otherwise fairly standard strings, numbers, um, things like that. So you, you can read more about some of the syntactic nuances here uh, on the website about TOML. Um, this shows you a, of what YAML looks like. And so again, you can see the important role that uh, indentation plays here. So again, this is a nested dictionary inside, you know, that's associated with this particular key here. Um, you know, this is overall defining a set of lists uh, and sub items for lists, which again are essentially like arrays basically. So again, you know, to really learn this, you're gonna have to just dive into it. There will be a little bit of an opportunity to exercise these things on the homework, but this aspect of the homework, because package templates does so much for you initially, does not dive deep into either one of these formats. And I think actually that's an overall good thing and that uh, I recommend as you'll see at the end to learn essentially as little of these formats as you can to get by and consult the documentation when you need it. This just shows you an example of actually how Julia uses the TOML format and its project.toml file. So there's the name of the package. This unique uh, identifier for your package um, is something that essentially disambiguate. If somebody else were to name a package called Julia Interpreter, this would disambiguate the two of them. And this version number, this is one of the things that you might edit, that you will edit by hand, for instance, when you want to make a new release. 
This section here indicates which packages yours depends upon. Some of these are, are sort of regular packages, others of them are standard libraries. And in this compat section here, we declare which versions of code this pack, this current version of that of Julia Interpreter is compatible with. So it's compatible with any Julia 1.x release. And that covers not just Julia itself, but also any of the standard libraries, which here are interactive utils, random, and new UIDs. It does rely on one external package code tracking. And this just indicates that it needs at least version 0.5.9 or anything on the 1.x release of code tracking. And then this package is also tested against many other repositories, the other packages, which are not required to build and use Julia Interpreter. They're only required for the tests. And that's, those are in these extra section here. And they're again listed by name and UUID. Their package uh, uh, standard library gives you nice automated ways. You don't have to go looking up these UUIDs yourself. It will add them for you, but you may have to copy and paste them from the depth section to the extras section. And then you list for, uh, you have to list which of the extras are used for which purposes. And overwhelmingly, the common thing is the test target, as it's called. It's used, it's needed for running the packages tests. Okay. Um, that's how Julia makes use of a project.toml file. One of the GitHub Actions files is shown here. So this one again is in YAML. And you can see, just to walk you through the barest elements of the syntax, I'm not going to go in, uh, dive deep here, but this says, when does this action run? And it runs anytime there's a pull request. And it runs on a subset of, of, of pushes. It pushes if it uh, goes to a branch called master. Some projects use main instead of master. And also anytime you're tagging a new version of the package. Okay. And then what jobs does it run? This, this, this gives each job a name. You saw some of those names when we browsed the results from the continuous integration test run there. Those were named essentially according to the scheme that's here. And you can see that this section here describes which versions of Julia is it tested on, 1.0, the current release, and nightly. Uh, which operating systems is it run on, all of the three main operating systems here, and which computer architectures. You can choose 32 or 64-bit machines, 64-bit are the sort of overwhelming default choice. This package, because it's tested on many different things, it, it, it actually builds a version of Python so that it can call test Julia's ability to call Python code um, and other things like that. The key part, aside from the sort of initial setup here, is what sequence of steps occur when you do the, do the continuous integration. And you may recall when we checked the logs, there were several different steps. I could expand the triangles associated with each one of those steps. And what a lot of those correspond to are these individual lines here, these, these uses that use these Julia actions. Okay? And what these Julia actions are, you may remember I mentioned a GitHub um, uh, organization that hosts different actions that are used for building your package, for running your test suite, for processing the coverage, and submitting it up to CodeCub, for instance, in this particular case, right? And so that's what this sequence of steps is all done. Again, you don't have to write this yourself, right? Package templates will create the first version of it for you, but it's it, eventually you may find that you need to know enough about this to be able to modify the configuration because you want to do something unique to your particular project. The last thing I just should touch on, because we haven't really touched on the meaning of these version numbers in this course yet. And uh, Julia, like many, many different programming communities, uses a, a numbering scheme called semantic versioning. And, and in rough terms, and it, it, the reality is often a little more com complicated than this, but that any time, if, if you've already re reached 1.0 for your package, then henceforth, if you are making a change that is a breaking change, meaning that the new version of your package will be will will not be uh, will not successfully run some old code that used to run using your package, you should increment this first number, so-called major number, right? So this is for for indicating a breaking release. Obviously, you don't make breaking releases lightly because all of your users may have to update their code in some painful ways, right? But sometimes you have to if you, if, to really make your product as good as it needs to be. And when you do that, you indicate that by changing this number. If you're adding new features but not breaking the package, right, then this is the number that you're incrementing. 
right? So you may have some new function that you can call in your package that introduces extra capabilities it didn't have, or new keyword arguments that are a substantial change and not just like a kind of a behind the scenes background detail, right? You, for for a, a genuine new feature that your users, you know, may actually interact with, this is the digit you should increment. And then if you're fixing bugs, this is the digit you should increment. Now, when you increment one of the higher digits, you reset the next counters to zero, right? So when you go to version two of your package from a 1.x release cycle, it becomes 2.0.0, right? And then you increment these from there. Um, you can also add a few things at the end. For instance, if you're, uh, you know, major, major uh, projects sometimes release alpha and beta versions of their package, and that can be indicated down here. You can also indicate metadata about, say, what, when and how something was built for consumption by other people. Um, OK, so that pretty much wraps it up. Again, so this has been a tour of the sort of process of getting continuous integration working and a description of what it is and what its advantages are. Um, uh, it's fantastic how much the Julia community has done to make this easy so that you don't really have to know a lot of about Toml and YAML to get going. Um, you just consult the documentation on a, on a need to know basis. You really rely on package templates and the continuous improvements in the, uh, created by the folks who maintain Julia Actions. Um, that's a huge, uh, not always recognized service that the community provides to all of the packages in the ecosystem. So go visit your favorite actions and give them GitHub stars. They, they, they do a lot to make your life a lot easier. Um, and so, you know, in general, the overall summary, you know, learning this process of DevOps, of course, takes time. Anything new, if this is not familiar to you, takes time to learn. But, you know, the Julia community has really gone to great lengths to make it as easy as possible. And I'm sure, I don't know from personal experience, but I'm sure that similar efforts are underway in other programming languages. And, and, and you know, that'll be a great thing there, too. It's also unavoidable that you do sometimes have to do work to maintain this, the, the whole infrastructure, right? In the same way that you sometimes have to do work to maintain your tests, you have to maintain this apparatus for running your tests. And there is a time cost associated with that. There's no doubt about that. But the most important thing and the thing that why it remains in active use throughout the Julia community is that it tends to give you more time than it costs you, right? It makes it much easier for you to review the pull requests, gives you the confidence that even when you're getting a contribution from an outside developer who's never contributed to your package before, you can find out whether this change has broken things. You don't have to ask them, did you run the tests before submitting this? You see the results of the tests before your eyes, right? It gives you the freedom to release really frequently if you want to do that, right? And I often make a, if I, fi if I merge a bug fix, I try to remember to put a release out immediately, right? I increment that little last patch digit, the bug, bug fix digit and put out another release and 15 seconds later, it's, you know, it's, it's out there, 15 minutes later, it's in the hands of users. And then overall, this whole thing, of course, automates a lot of steps that would otherwise be quite painful, right? I don't have to write the release notes for that bug fix. They get created automatically for me. Um, and so while there is a cost to maintaining the system, it gives more than it, than it requires to keep it running. Um, and, you know, I think overall, you know, this clearly already is the standard in the Julia community. And so, you know, not doing it makes you a big outlier. And, you know, my guess is that this will become a standard in many other communities too. And so, you know, I strongly encourage you to learn about this. And Julia is a terrific place to learn about this overall framework, even if it's not, you know, your main programming language long term, because it's been set up so efficiently and so well here. So uh, I strongly encourage you to do that. Okay, that's the end. We'll see you in the next session.